are farming uh, full time in a sense, and yet they are allowed to continue farming only because they have another job, mm -hmm. uh, or because their wife is, is working at the hospital, or, or some such situation as this. Mm -hmm. uh, the farm, they're losing money on the farm, but they want to have their children raised on the farm away from the city, and uh, they're actually willing to be farmers at a loss just so they can have their children raised in a good situation. Yes, that's right. The total income from off-the-farm jobs exceeds the on-farm jobs. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. Today's topic is responsibility to rural prosperity, and we're pleased to present Hugh Crane, who farms at Good Thunder, Minnesota. Hugh will moderate today's program and introduce today's guests. And then there's the loss. Now, who do they sell to? The corporate farmer. Either the corporate farm or to another neighbor who is already overcrowded at his work schedule, and who, by the way, is not getting any return for his investment. Today we're visiting with, on my immediate left, Father Halloran, who is the chaplain at Newman Center in Mankato State College. Mankato State College has an enrollment of about 12,500 students now. And Mankato is in the heart of some of the best farmland in all of Minnesota, in fact, of all of the nation. I remember from my geography that the land in this area was rich as that in the Valley of the Nile. Father Halloran was born and raised on a farm in Minnesota and is now working with young students at Mankato State, and we welcome his addition to this discussion. Also on my left, Dr. Fred Brown, who is an assistant professor of history at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota, about 12 miles from Mankato. They have a student enrollment there of about 1,750 students. And uh, Dr. Brown has traveled extensively in Europe and Japan to study politics and the economic life there. He was born and raised in rural Nebraska and has a real interest in rural problems, particularly the idea of Urbania and its effect on the producers of farm products. What is the connection, Fred, between Urbania, urban and rural problems, and farm problems? Well, as I see it, Hugh, that we are concerned with uh, urban problems with great talk about it. And recently, we're finally getting around to recognizing that the urban problem rests upon the rural problem. Now, if you're going to talk about rural problems, you have to start with a farmer, unfortunately. But you do, that he seems to be the rock bottom problem here and that so many of the young people who are going off to the cities and who then become problems of urban America, people looking for an opportunity, both black and white, uh, come from the farm or from those industries and businesses closely associated with the farm. And it seems to me that if we're to develop a new lifestyle, a style that is looking toward an America that combines the benefits of both rural and urban America, that helps to relieve the pressures off the city by developing new kinds of life on in the rural area it has to be done first by considering well who's already there and what are their problems and can we save who's there before we talk about saving the millions from the city and helping them come out to a new life in connection to the city we better talk about the farmer who's in the worst state of, of any in the farm right now father you're dealing every day with the students at mankato state through your newman center work who are rural people, rural students. What are they saying about the rural problems these days? I think that they're, of course, at the college, principally for one purpose, to get an education, but secondarily and maybe primarily, the education will make it possible for them to earn a living in, in the future. And one statement you get from time to time is that uh, the farm isn't big enough for both dad and me, and if I were to get married, then certainly isn't large enough, so there's no possibility of my going back to the farm, and I can make more money elsewhere. Sometimes you get the comments along these lines, well, if I could afford to start farming, I could afford to retire. Uh, costs are so high, everything I have to buy is way out of line. Uh, as a result of this, uh, 
why should I invest in something that is so uncertain? Uh, there's no future. If I go into teaching, uh, I'm fairly well certain that I can make a living wage. There, uh, there is the uh, National Education Association, there's the uh, Federation of Teachers, uh, they're organized. And, uh, and anything else, of course, that you go into too, they're aware of the fact that uh, they're going to be protected by some kind of an organization that is going to see to it that they make a living wage. And they have no guarantee on the farm. And uh, the insecurity is, uh, is always a problem with them. Do you think that um, young people uh, actually demand a guarantee of uh, security, or are they looking for a place of responsibility and they cannot find responsibility in the rural areas? I pose that as a problem. Well, I think it's both, uh, Hugh. I, I think they want a responsibility, but uh, nowadays in our capitalistic society, if you are going to be responsible, you need a certain amount of money. And you can't fulfill a responsibility today. You can't re uh, fulfill a responsibility to your family. You can't uh, uh, fulfill a responsibility to your, to your church, uh, to the community, literally. Uh, if, you, if you can't uh, meet the uh, payment at the bank, uh, which is a pretty basic responsibility, then uh, how can they even think in terms of responsibility to the entire community, which is so important. Mm -hmm. I think they all see that uh, our whole economy depends on the farmer. Uh, they'd like to share this responsibility. I, I don't think they question this, uh, but uh, again, there's the uncertainty. How can you be responsible w without the wherewithal? Yes, and uh, responsibility would suggest that we need uh, involvement in all of the uh, movements of the rural area, and I've often thought about how can you get more people involved? Do they know that uh, involvement entails the responsibility that you just mentioned. And how are we going to get involvement pointed towards the direction of getting the income that you've just mentioned? How are we going to raise prices? Now, we in NFO think we've got the answer, Fred, and we've worked long and hard on it, and you've watched with some mm -hmm. interest now. Uh, what would you suggest in this relationship? Well, it seems to me, Hugh, that everybody organizes. We've talked this many times, but you know that teachers are organized, and uh, we know that even baseball players now are organized. It seems to me that the farmer has to see the trend, that, that he can't bargain individually. He's going to have to get together, and his object has to be first place prices. Now, from my point of view, I know as a consumer that probably if he's successful, I'm going to have to pay a little more. But the alternative to me is more disastrous than, than if he wins, because if he wins, I know that he will stay in the community. He'll spend his profits, which he is organized to get. He'll spend those profits in my hometown, and he'll send his kids to the college to which I teach. But if he has to give up his farm and move out, and particularly if corporate farms come in, then I know that the profits, again, which I have to pay through my consumption, are not going to come back to my hometown. They're not going to come back to the college to which I teach. They are going to go off to Wall Street or to, to the banks of the great cities, and they're not going to come to me in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And to me, therefore, I say organize, get your price. If that costs me as a consumer a little more, fine, and then I'll welcome you across the street in community affairs. I'll teach your children, and it'll make a more lively community for me, mm -hmm. and that'll be worth it to me as a consumer. I think that's a good point. You know, if, if the corporate farmer does take over our small farms, these corporate farmers will get organized. And the prices that are being demanded today by the small farmer are going to be paid. And uh, much better to keep the small farmer on the farm. I, I, I don't use the word small farm in a derogatory way by any means, uh, a rather complimentary phrase. Uh, but uh, sooner or later, the farm prices are going to be reached. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's going to be up to the community, literally, to see to it that we get these prices to the farmers uh, who live on the farm now or later on to corporations who are going to be able to control prices right across the board. Let's consider a minute this price increase. I and all the other farmers in the United States produce enough food for myself and my family, and in addition, enough food for 42 other people. This is the abundance of our farm production these days. Now, if each of those 42, including Father, you and Fred, mm -hmm. were to pay 10 cents per day, that would mean $4.20 per day that I'd be getting if it would get to the farm level where we as family farm operators could have this money, I would have $4.20 more at 10 cents per day per consumer to add to my so-called profits. 
which at this point are not there. But that would make me a profit for the year, just this 10 cents per day. So it's not a great amount of money we're talking about. We're talking about a relatively small amount of money. Mm -hmm. And there's another set of figures, as long as I'm on the subject, that I'd like to call to your attention. I have been looking through some of the United States Department of Agriculture bulletins, and I've came up across some rather interesting figures. The one particularly in this bulletin, which is the farm income estimate, state by state and nationally as well. If it is, it is FIS Supplement 211, if you would want to write to the United States Department of Agriculture for this bulletin. And on one of the pages there, I saw these figures. The cash receipts from farm marketings, for an example, in 1952, just 15 years ago, amounted, after you take farm production expenses from it, to $9,898,000,000. In 1967, cash receipts from farm marketings, less farm production expenses, amount to only $7,968,000,000. So in 15 years, we've lost $1,000,000,000 nine hundred and thirty million dollars because of our inability to ask for a fair price this has in effect done this it is said that i have to go to the market this day and i have to ask them please won't you take all the farm production that i have these truckloads of grain this truckloads of livestock the semis of farm production of whatever nature, fruits, vegetables, peanuts, nuts, cotton, tobacco, whatever. And I say, won't you please, Mr. Processor, or Mr. Buyer of Farm Products, won't you please take this abundance of farm production for, from me for $650 less than you paid my dad for it? I am, in reality, as all the other farmers are, farming the land that dad used to farm and in addition to my own land, and in addition to also to some of my neighbor's land. And I am producing this great abundance, and I'm going to the market and place and play, saying, please, won't you give me $650 less than I got for it 15 years ago? Now, this is the problem of farm pricing. This is the problem that NFO particularly is in its throes of development, in trying to find farmers who will agree in principle with the idea of collective bargaining for agriculture. And I think that sooner or later that every man who is raising farm production will recognize the value of collective bargaining and want to help to get a better price for his agricultural products. Now, Fred, we've talked about this pricing thing. Does it bring to you, your mind, the other problems of rural America that have and will be affected by a fair price for agricultural production? Very definitely, Hugh. I'm thinking about the, what happens in a town when you don't get what you deserve, when you, the farmer, don't be, aren't able to make a living. What it's going to do then in terms of, of pumping money into that town, what it's going to do in terms of the tax base of that town, and that, you know, that's a great concern. When you start talking about your school system, when you talk about your community hospital, you realize that rural schools are worse off than urban and suburban schools, that the health facilities are worse for community hospitals. How do you keep a doctor in there, for example, when you don't have that money coming in from the farm community? And I'm thinking in terms of recreation. We talk about soil conservation. We talk about what the farmer ought to do to contribute to recreation. And then you say, well, uh, the farmer ought to give us some of that forest over there. He ought to give us some land. How can he? He needs it. Now, if you give him an income, maybe you can talk turkey with him about giving a little to the county or to the city. And it seems to me, above all, too, that we lose those good young people. They go off to the city, and then we don't get their brains. We don't get their beauty. We don't get any of the resource there that we have created. And we train them. We educate them. We raise them and send them off to live someplace else. And we don't get that benefit. And it, that leads me to one other point, Hugh. I don't want to talk on this too much because there are lots of things we must cover. But that is that business of the value that we talk about as the traditional rural value. Now, I think that one can make too much of this. But there is something about seeing the, the, the man stand upon his land. 
The man, I don't want to have to say to my children, I guess this is a nutshell, Hugh. I don't want to say to my grandchildren, once upon a time, there was a man called a farmer. And he lived just outside of town here. But, of course, he's gone now. I don't want to say that, Hugh. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about small towns which can grow, which come alive, but because it represents a, a total community. I don't want a community which has lost one of its most important segments. I always think of the emphasis that is placed on the term family farm. And we hear much discussion about that these days, what size of the family farm ought to be, who ought to be in family farm operation. Does that include just the man who owns the farm, or does it ought to include his family, his kids? Who all does the family farm mean? And I would like to pose this question to you. Uh, Father, what do you think the term family farm implies? I think, first of all, uh, the term family is the important concept there. Uh, you're talking about a situation of uh, the father and the mother and the children. And uh, immediately, uh, we have to be concerned about the welfare of this family, which means an adequate income to support the family. A living wage, and whether a man is, is uh, single or married, is still based on the concept that he has a family that one day, at least, he will have a family. Mm -hmm. uh, so right away, we're saying that a family is that which is the center of our society, the basis of our society. And of course, there's no place better for the family to be, at least I'm convinced of this, than to be raised on a farm. Uh, the family farm, then, should be such that uh, it would support the entire family. Uh, I think, at least in this area, it's very obvious that uh, the farmer will work he works very diligently every moment he has for the farm. His wife is likely to be working also on the farm. The children, when they're home from school, are working. And uh, the odds are even that if they're going to stay on the farm today, they almost have to have a job in the city as well. I, I find uh, at the college that uh, numerous parents will come to me and uh, will say that, well, we earn so much in the city uh, carrying the dinner pail and the dinner bucket and the rest, and uh, then we go home to the farm and work twice as hard, and uh, we come out even. We, we lose what we made uh, in the city. Now, this is certainly not a family farm situation. Uh, that's not even a way of living anymore. It's uh, not, certainly not a way of making a living. It's family farm living without income, isn't it? Right. Getting by, so Which to speak. Which is an impossible situation. Yes. And if we had that income to prosper the farms, there can be no question and general agreement that this is also going to prosper the small towns and the large towns and the cities and the metropolitan centers as well. Yes. What we fail to recognize is that whose responsibility is it to maintain, to get, to price ourselves into this prosperous condition? I maintain that it's my responsibility. I don't believe that the government owes it to me to provide me with a living for my endeavors. I believe that I have to be honest enough with myself to demand a fair day's wages for a fair day's work. And I think that in our capitalistic system where profits generate our taxes in the whole country that I also owe the responsibility to everyone in the nation to generate enough profit to become a useful tool of our government, a useful tool in our nation. But now how are we going to get this message mm -hmm. to those rugged individualists who perhaps because of some background situation, because of some extra special type of uh, farm inheritance perhaps that they've had, how are we going to involve them? Where are we going to be able to tell them, oh, look, no, you need to help us. You need to become your brother's keepers. How can we tell them that? I'm curious, Hugh, whether, whether farmers being uh, as busy as they are, as as concerned as they are with just getting through the, the labors that they must go through, whether they really know always uh, what their income is, what their depreciation is, if they can follow this carefully enough, when you ta talk in terms of the national budget, when you talk in terms of price increases, I know that for me, uh, who lives off a simple salary, it's difficult enough. And I don't have a great deal of outside investments. If I had them, I know it would be much more difficult. It seems to me that one thing the NFO can do is clearly point out time and time again that, that there is a real need here to understand your financial status, or whether you're living off your depreciation or whether you're living off the inflation of the land. I think that that's one, 
one definite thing that they have to get straight first. Are, am I making money or aren't I? And then if they find out they're not, and I dare say they probably will, then they must look to organize themselves. Yes, and organizing, of course, is our theme. We think that we must bargain together so we can sell together and so we can profit together. And Father, what uh, do you think about the NFO programs as you visualize them today, as you've worked with them and as you've associated well, with people I, uh, who have become involved? I think, you that just from the last couple of weeks, I had an experience that uh, pretty well summarizes my thoughts on this. Uh, the whole program of withholding, uh, let's face it, our, our system is based on supply and demand a great deal. And if, if you can take care of 42 other people by your work, uh, well, your, your granaries just aren't big enough to hold that. You, you have to get rid of it. I, I realize that. And the pigs get so large, and you have to get rid of them, or you're losing money by feeding them, and the price goes down as they reach a certain weight. But uh, as you know, we've had a lot of snow in Minnesota in the last two months. And uh, it got bad enough so that God saw to it that the farmer was withholding his crop. You couldn't get trucks to the, to the barn. You, you couldn't get trucks to uh, the pens. And uh, the prices went up. And I think if the farmer could take a lesson from God and uh, say, well, God, you've sent us enough snow here in Minnesota. Uh, we, we've uh, received a much better price for hogs than we had ever expected. Now let us sell them. Uh, and sure enough, the, the prices will go down as we've already seen. The snow has broken somewhat. And uh, the first day that the plows were getting through to the barns, the pigs dropped $1.75 a hundred. Well, uh, I think if we can uh, keep, keep up with God, if you will, on this, I think we'd be in good shape. If we can cooperate with one another and with God in the efforts that are going to be essential for us to maintain or at least get started on maintaining a decent level of prosperity for farmers and all the rest of rural America and the nation as well, then we will have uh, served a useful purpose. Well, this is 1969. We're less than a year away from turning into another decade. The 1960s have been bleak years for rural people at a time when technological advances, new innovations, and new methods have made it possible for the American farmer to raise more food for more people than any other farmer in the world. The buying comes in our inability to generate price increases. If we are to generate a pricing formula sufficient to pull agriculture out of the stagnated pool of insufficient income, if we're going to mean ready and able to feed the 10 million hungry in the United States and to provide sustenance for the starving in other countries, if we're going to fulfill our God-given mission on earth to truly become our brother's keepers, if we're going to again become a living part of this great nation, if we're going to accept a responsibility to prosperity, we must continue organizing so we can bargain from a position of strength. We as individual farmers have really but two choices. Number one, we can continue just as we are, the victims of a pricing system which has no consideration or no responsibility for our wants and our needs. Or two, we can join a strong farm bargaining organization, put our production together so we can bargain together and sell together so we as a group can negotiate our needs and our wants into terms of dollars. This is what the National Farm Organization is all about. The NFO is a do-it-yourself kit, where our individual responsibility is enlarged to include our neighbor's responsibility clear across this nation. The formula for success is simple. Total production times an adequate price equals rural prosperity. If you feel that the NFO program is right for you, and if you're ready to participate in rural prosperity, write to NFO Corning, Iowa, and tell them that you're ready to get a fair farm price for your farm production. All we need is you. And as soon as you have made up your mind that you want rural prosperity, we can have rural prosperity. Thank you, gentlemen, so very much for being with us on this panel today, Father Halloran. My honor, privilege. Thank it's been you. a real Thank pleasure you. to discuss these problems with you. Thank Ted, you. 
Thank it's you. It's been great to have you here. We hope that Gustavus Adolphus will uh, keep participating in these rural programs as much as they have in the past. And Father, your work at Newman Center is fantastic. There are so many young people who I talk with that know you and know you well and who will seek your advice and follow it. And I'm sure I'm thankful that we have a man of your stature and your bearing here in the Mankato community. Fred, I, I hope that we are finally going to get community and farm together, Hugh, to uh, organize both for their own interests, which I think are common interests. That the farmer will organize to keep alive and that the communities will organize to keep alive, that we'll be there when America begins to turn to us, when the cities are truly too crowded and too polluted, etc., we'll be there clean, organized, ready to go, and ready to make a profit. And isn't it an amazing thing that maybe just a few years ago, we would have been almost afraid to talk about farm prices. It seemed like it was almost taboo that the polite thing was, that was being said was, we have to get more efficient, we have to get larger and bigger, we have to do all these fine things that the universities and the colleges and the farm people and the county agents said were necessary to uh, affect an abundance. Well, we did that. We, we broke the barrier of 200 bushel corn, and we broke the barrier of 100 bushel beans. And incidentally, you'd be interested in this. The cost of increased production means that I am going to have to pay, if I live up to what my fellow farmers are doing, $8.35 for this extra super efficiency, this extra super effort to raise our yields for every $4.96 that I'll get back. These figures are also borne out in this bulletin that I showed you earlier in the program. So I'm putting out $8.35 for each approximately $5 I'll get back. Well, you know that's not very good business, man. No, I'm not going to be able to do that <laughs> so very long. Uh, you know, it's true, you and... Uh, uh, Fred is making the same point here. I don't think the average person in uh, urban America really understands the farm problem. Y as much as we've talked about it, we haven't talked enough. Uh, many of them recall the days right uh, during the Second World War and right after when the farmer did do pretty well. He really did. And I, I don't think any farmer would deny that. And uh, they just go back to that. Well, I remember when. And, uh, we have to bring people up to date, that's all, as you did with your figures there on the last 15 years. We hear so much uh, generally about the word involvement, and this is what the NFO is trying to do. I'm trying to help my neighbor. I'm trying to get my neighbor to help me. And I'm trying to involve you, man, and your vast knowledge and your learning and your students in the thing that we know is right. We know it's right because it has to be right. That's the only solution, is uh, in my estimation and in my opinion, to increase prices of farm production to take care of the many, many problems sociologically and economically in the rural areas. And the sooner we get on with that problem and the sooner we recognize that we do have the muscle, we do have the product, that we can get it, we will have farm prosperity. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture.